Planners don't always see eye to eye with architects. They're too small-minded, too aesthetically frigid, too risk-averse. Well, not in Croydon. In the 1960s, Croydon experienced a massive property boom driven by a powerful head of planning, James Marshall. He deployed striking architecture to rework the city centre in his vision of a modern business district. And the 60s was a time of bold political and architectural projects, but now it is very rare to see a local authority think so proactively about urban design. However, Croydon's always been unusual, if not unique, and today the town is once again being reworked through a series of local authority-led master plans. So what can a new generation of architects do to address the problems of the past while enhancing Croydon's complex character? And as a new London mayor settles into office, what can we learn from the council's brave approach? There's a very nice model, I think from the 50s or 60s, of Croydon as a whole. And it looks like an ice skating rink. And uh, all the buildings look like these beautiful objects skating around on this big ground. And of course the whole of Croydon is almost built on one big artificial ground because it's got basements underneath servicing the whole thing. That has also had the consequence that some of these buildings actually now seem to be a little bit lost in that space and it's not necessarily quite as beautiful as that wonderful model. The businesses went in before everything else there. You know, the last thing to come was like Caluccio's. The first thing to come in was the, the towers. You're trying to develop and regenerate when you've already got a kind of commercial area and you're building on that as a platform rather than another piece of city where you've got residents, you've got businesses, you've got different types of agencies all operating together in the same space. There's been successive waves of politicians and planners in Croydon who have been grappling with this. How do we move on from what happened in the 60s and 70s, learn from the mistakes, and, but continue to do something big and bold? Historically, there was focus on kind of the object of this new building and how great that was going to be, and not that much consideration to the, what was happening around it. Or if you're talking about roads, like just do the road and not worry about how that affects what surrounds it. And I think that the difference now is that there are still these quite grand projects, but it seems that the council are much more um, sensitive to and concerned with the setting that goes around all of those things. And in that way, it's a much more humane way of looking at development. Whatever you do planning-wise or development-wise, you're thinking about the total place. It's not just about the built form, it's actually about how it looks and feels as well. In a way, Croydon reminds me of somewhere like Manchester in the early 90s, which was a place where there really was, were very few people living in the city centre at all. And it underwent this enormous uh, renaissance kind of over the, the next kind of 10, 15 years, where there was a very active programme of re reintroducing a population to a place that had been formerly a place really exclusively of business. And I think that's what the potential is that Croydon has now, and the council are very actively trying to um, make public spaces and make public infrastructure that's going to allow for that change to take place. So Croydon has a series of very ambitious master plans that cover a lot of the city centre and this effectively came out of a history of Croydon having a terrible reputation in terms of how outsiders thought of the city. There was a huge move to basically almost mend the city, put the city back together. Projects like this, the East Croydon Bridge by Hawkins Brown, have been thoughtfully designed to address an array of pragmatic problems that make it hard to navigate the city. I think the key thing about the bridge is that the tracks provide this great big split down the middle of Croydon. Um, and we were looking at ways of trying to stitch and knit together the two sides of the city. The idea of creating a live and active bridge emerged. It's not just a way of getting into the station, we wanted it to be a living bridge. And it works for two sets of users. It works as a station entrance. You can go up the bridge, you can buy a ticket, and you can get now to the northern end of the station. But it also works in this wider connection um, to, to help link these communities back together again. People can now walk to the Whitgift shopping centre, the centre of Croydon, without having to make a half-mile detour around the station. I think the East Croydon Great Station Bridge by uh, Hawkins Brown and Egg Ray West is a terrific project in its own right. But what's 
particularly successful about it is that it's part of a larger mini master plan for that area. A plan that includes Muffs Park, a lot of new housing, the Box Park restaurant district. And I think this method that the local authorities developed of asking often quite young architects to develop uh, mini master plans for areas of strategic growth within Croydon is a really exciting development. Uh, it's planning that's no longer about just development control and it's actively trying to envisage the, the change that's going to come. So the work that we did in South End was looking at the high street there and how the public realm could be improved. So some of the interventions were relatively modest. Um, so there was a couple of new benches and a new tree, for example, on a little pocket of public space um, that turn it from being somewhere that's kind of windswept and a bit horrible into somewhere that's actually quite nice to have, have a seat. And then some larger changes, but it was little pockets of intervention and change rather than thinking something on one site was going to fix the whole area. When we came to Croydon and you asked people about their relationship to public transport, for instance, for many people it was not existing. And that's despite the fact that they've got the railway and the tram and the buses. So for us, the public realm project was about increasing access to the public transport. It was very much about understanding how to make the station more present so that uh, one could sort of enhance West Croydon as a front door. And then secondly, it was about strengthening a sense of place. And the arches really came out of a desire to create a dialogue between the two sides of the street. And some of the listed, locally listed facades on, on the other side of Station Road had this sort of arched structure that strengthened a sense of street and connection and ability to move from one place to another. When it comes to looking at the city at a closer scale, it definitely starts to become more at the scale of public realm design and how elements of a city are joined together. What we're really interested in is the way in which architecture and design is relevant to a huge range of people. So it's not just architects or designers that are interested in that. Um, that actually the everyday person is really affected by the things that architects do and that the work that we do should be legible to them and they should be able to appreciate. It doesn't need to be some kind of high-minded concept. But if you write South End in really big letters on a newly refurbished building, that people kind of stop and take stock of that. I think it's a visible statement of kind of feeling positive about an area and that's what we're trying to, I guess, instill in people. These are projects that reject the idea of the planet as God. Brash, towering monuments have been replaced with small, seemingly modest interventions. The architects have turned their attention away from the pure interests of the market and focus instead on the locals who predominantly use the area. Public consultations, workshops and walking tours have been used throughout to inform decisions, ensuring that external designers are giving the community what it needs. In the 60s, the way the Croydon was planned was basically to take advantage of quite specific legislation to boost the economy of Croydon as much as possible. So as many office blocks as possible, as many jobs as possible. But it didn't really start to think about how people could live in the city, how they could even walk around. There was a failure to imagine how the spaces between these monumental new buildings might be occupied. Today, I think the big change is that there's a commitment to making an environment that's lifelike. Many of these projects are far less heroic in scale than the work that was undertaken in the 60s, but they're absolutely vital to ensuring that Croydon has a future and can accommodate this enormous new growth that's coming soon. You want to create a great place, don't you? You know, the, the essence of regeneration is just creating great places that are, um, that are sustainable. For me, you know, you want the legacy of what we're doing as an authority, as a local authority, to be they really thought through what they were doing. Because Croydon has waited for years for this opportunity, and we've got one shot at getting this right, and it would be irresponsible for us as public sector bodies, responsible for driving that regeneration, to not think about the whole place. This is a town which now recognises the absolute importance of a human connection in the public realm. From small things like carefully placing a bench to big gestures like building a massive footbridge over a busy railway. A new chapter in the story of Croydon is being written by developers, architects, civil servants and the public working together for the common good. It's a story which other boroughs, as well as Sadiq Khan, would be wise to take note of. <laughs>